Hey, if you want to learn more about generative AI and software testing, you've come to the right place. Today, we were talking with Mark Winningham all about his new book, Software Testing with Generative AI. You probably know him, but just in case, if you don't, Mark is a quality engineer, course director, and author of the book, Software Testing with Generative AI, and the book, Testing Web APIs. He has over 10 years of experience providing testing expertise on award-winning projects across a bunch of different technology sectors. He's also an advocate for modding risk-based testing practices, holistic-based automation strategies, behavior-driven development, and exploratory testing techniques. You can find him all over the socials. We'll have a link for it in the show notes, but you definitely want to listen all the way to the end to get the most of how you can leverage generative AI for real, with testing, no BS. You don't want to miss it. Check it out. Hey, test automation engineers. Are you tired of maintaining in-house grids? Are you struggling with limited device coverage? Say hello to Browser Stack Automate, your ticket to effortless cross-browser testing. Get instant access to over 20,000 real devices and browsers, and you can run Selenium, Cypress, Playwright, and more with, even better, minimal latency. So get crystal clear test summaries and powerful debugging tools at your fingertips. You also get interactive debugging, web performance reports, and support for advanced use cases like 2FA and payment workflows. Scale your testing without the headaches. Browser stack automate because your apps deserve the best. Ready to supercharge your testing? Try browser stack automate for yourself today. Head on over to testguild.me forward slash browser stack and check it out for yourself. Hey, Mark, welcome to the Back to the Guild. Hi, uh, Joe. Yeah, it's good to be back again. I think third time now, fourth time? Yeah, at least. It's been it's, uh, three or four, so it's great to have you back. I'm, yeah. uh, I'm actually wearing my Selenium Conference t-shirt. Oh, the nice. Last time we did this, when we did the live stream. So uh, Perfect, perfect. Yep. Thought in honor. Sweet. So... You know, Mark, you're always busy, and I'm always curious. I always I asked you this last time: Why write another book? I know you you took like a long time to write your previous book, and I thought, oh, there's no way he's going to do it again. And a year later, you, are you a full time <laughs> writer? What's going on? Um, yeah, I, I I find myself asking myself the same question quite a lot at the moment as I near the end, like the sort of the light at the end of the tunnel is almost there. So. It's sort of that final push. Um, so you do start asking yourself the same sort of questions. Um, I think ultimately it is just down to the fact that I enjoy writing. I enjoy the process of, um, you know, putting this sort of material together. I enjoy teaching. I've always enjoyed teaching. Um, but what's been kind of different for this book compared to the last one. So with testing web APIs, I kind of went in with an idea of what the book was going to be. Like I'd been teaching. Uh, web API testing for quite a while. So I felt confident with what that was going to be. Whereas this one's been much more of a collaboration with the publisher, um, you know, and focusing on generative AI. Although although the concept's been around for a while, the actual sort of kind of day-to-day -day public usage of it's only been obviously in the last couple of years with the rise of things like ChatGPT. So it's kind of a greenfield sort of space to be exploring, which makes it exciting um and it's really been fascinating finding out about sort of researching the tools and how they work but also as well it can be a little a little scary um but fortunately like a lot of the stuff i've done in the past around my attitudes towards automation kind of infuse in this book as well so that's that's sort of kind of given me a start for 10 as well so that's what i'm going to say uh what skills allow you to do this because as you mentioned it's not like oh it's not API testing, everyone knows it, but at least it was like a known kind of thing that you've done for years and years. Now you're dipping your water in something that's like, seems to be changing every month, every, it's like, how do you create a book or how do you research it to make it so it's going to be when it finally is released that it's on point and it's still relevant? Um, so I think, first of all, you accept that that's not going to happen which is, you know, it seems like a bit of a cop out, but yeah, uh, things things keep changing and keep evolving. I would say... This time last year, it felt faster than it does this time this year. Um, I think things are kind of sort of starting to coalesce and slow down a little bit enough, for, I think, with the broad strokes to sort of kind of take stock of how generative AI could be used in, in a testing context. Um, in terms of like research, it was a lot of conversations 
with people, um, people within the testing community, um, a lot of tool providers um, opened access and let me have, let me have conversations with them and pick their brains about AI. Um, and it was sort of setting a lot of sort of passive ways of sort of learning about stuff. So lots of newsletters, lots of blog post reading, um, using um, things like ChatGPT as well to sort of kind of dig into some of the meanings behind some of the tools and stuff like that. So it's sort of a combination of, of all those things. Um, I've always been kind of an outcome driven person in terms of how I teach and how I write. So I always have a clear idea of what I want the reader or the person attending my workshop to do at a certain point. So although the kind of the information and maybe links to things change, you know, Google really are giving me for a run for my money. They probably will rename Gemini to something else just before the book goes out. I've just really, I've just had to go through and change it from Bard. Um, you know, those things will happen. But what I hope is, is that the kind of the core themes around the relationship between us as individuals with these tools will stay roughly the same. Because as much as the tools change, I don't think that that kind of the way that we engage with tools changes that much. And there's a lot to talk about in that space as well. Right, so is there anything that did change? You said it's kind of slowed down from when you started till now that that made you have to, uh, besides name changes, anything big? Has there been uh, a greater adoption to it than you thought it would be at this point in time? Or is there anything different than your assumption was a year ago to where it is now with, with the AI, with testing? Yeah, I thought I thought I would see more stuff in the tool vending space around it. I thought I thought we'd see more of that sort of stuff. You know, there was that big sort of kind of gold rush last year for sort of AI driven products everywhere. And you know, you've seen like little bits and pieces appear in tools and and I, and I, I was lucky enough to see some demonstrations of some of the things that tool vendors were working on. But actually it hasn't pushed that far forward. And I think that partially that's cuz you know, there's the sort of you know, there's the, 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 we're in the trough or heading down into the trough of disillusion. But what I hope as well in a more positive way is I think that the people creating the, a lot of testing tools are starting to appreciate that this is not, this is not the center of your product. This is something that can be added to sort of elevate certain aspects of the product, which is similar to what I'm talking about in the book. It's not about replacing what you do. It's about uh, picking those individual opportunities and then using these tools to help with that. So yeah, it's, I would say I take that as a positive really that there's not been such a sort of kind of uh, cynical uh, sort of land grab in terms of how these, how these tools are used. Um, but ultimately I think a lot of the other stuff kind of feels the same, you know, people have sort of engaged with these sort of tools in a shallow way. They've come up with a few foot thin things. It hasn't really worked out for them. And then they've kind of either sort of, dismissed it or moved on um whereas like yeah i wanted to spend a little bit more bit, bit more time with it a bit of a longer burn to sort of to understand how these tools could really sort of be integrated into our work so what could someone expect to get out of this book if they'd purchase it so I, I break the book into three parts um so i've got a quite clear mental model in my head these days of of how we approach it. So I always sort of say that value with generative AI is rooted in three principles, which is um, mindset, context, and technique. Um, so mindset is very important, and that's rooted in the mindset of what the value of testing is and, and how we do testing. So testing isn't a monoculture of test cases. It's a you know holistic whole of lots of different testing activities from automation to exploratory testing. And technique is things like understanding how um, how to use things like prompt engineering. How oh, and also in the mindset thing as well is how do these large language models work, and 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 appreciating that they don't think like us. They are probabilistic machines, and that they have their limitations as well. So in the mindset space, then in the technique, it's yeah, it's things like prompt engineering. It's understanding things like AI agents as well. And learning how to like, I, I, I'm saying this today is like, how do you sort of knock that needle towards the, you know, like in your favor? So, you know, if they're probabilistic machines, how do we sort of game the system so the probability is on your side in terms of the value you get? So, lots of techniques that can be learned there, and then context as well. So, large language models are very general 
based, you know, they're, they're, they're trained on such a massive corpus of data that it's kind of a bit of a garbage in garbage out situation. So if you ask it to uh, create test cases for an upload feature, it will just generically come up with a bunch of test cases because it wants to answer your questions for you. Whereas if we do something which is much more sort of um, here, test and upload feature, this is how it works. Here's some details about its technical specifications. Here's some business rules that are in place. Here's a bit of the code or the HTML, that sort of idea. Um, you get a better response back. So we need to bake context in. So that's looking at that as a principle, but also tools like retrieval augmented generation and fine tuning, because those are the tools that can help you with baking the context in. So yeah, it's exploring all of those. Um, and again, like, you know, demonstrating as well, like clear situations in which you could use these tools to sort of, you know, get the point across about how they can be useful in certain places. Perfect. I guess before we go any quicker, uh, any further, um, if someone's, I, I, most people might know this, but just in case, how do you define what is a large language model? Um, so in my mind, it is a um, neural network that has some sort of a transformer model um, that's applied to it. And then it's been trained with like, you know, billions, if not trillions of files of data, of text or images or audio files. And then inside that large language model, basically what you end up with is um, uh, lots of uh, individual sort of nodes or parameters that have like strong and weak uh, connections to one another. So the, the, that's where the probability comes in um, that help determine based on, you know, the word that it's generating, it will determine what's the next word to generate. What's the most probabilistic one. So happy birthday is high, more probable, probable than happy, um, happy. I've run over your dog <laughs> day. <laughs> You know, <laughs> terrible analogy, but you see what I mean. Like, it's very unlikely to say that, especially on a podcast. Um, <laughs> but, but that's ultimately it. it's a probabilistic model, lots of parameters that connected to, to each other in that way. I would say, like, my understanding of these is, you know, shallow because I don't think we need to know the the absolute intricacies of these tools because we are users of them. We are not people who are necessarily building them but appreciating at least that they are probabilistic and appreciating that we don't, or we should not be anthropomorphizing them. They are not us. They don't think like us. They are not creative like us. That is not a criticism. That's just what they are. Um, and that is of value in certain places. And I think once you get that appreciation, things get you get a lot more value out of it. And it's not changed with any tools, um, whether it's AI or not. I love that. You addressed this pretty early in chapter two, I think, with the LLM and prompt engineering, where you set up kind of like, you know, what is prompt engineering, how to get the most out of it. And also you talk about hallucinations. A lot of times people, you seem pretty even center where some people are like, oh, it's just, it's just all garbage anyway. It's going to hallucinate. You can't trust it. And on the right, you have it. It's 100% true. Uh, you seem to come down the middle, especially in chapter two. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Like, what people, what the expectations you're going to set, like maybe what skills they need for prompt engineering and then what things they need to worry about with hallucination, how common is it? Is it yeah. And is it all due to how well you do prompt engineering? Yeah, so I, that's, yeah, I, I think it's fair. I do sort of kind of sit in the center ground because, um, yeah, it, it's, it's kind of rooted in, in the prompt engineering. They, they are the techniques that you can use, but really it's about slicing. Um, and it's also understanding what these models are very good at and what they're not good at. So some of the examples I've seen shared that sort of kind of demonstrate its failings, I think are valid demonstrations of its failings, but, you know, don't use it that way. It doesn't mean, it doesn't negate the fact that it can be useful in other ways. Um, but equally as well, like, again, it's that sort of kind of garbage in, garbage out sort of situation of more like generic in, generic out. So if you are if you are approaching your problem, regardless of your tools, if you are approaching your problem from a very broad, high level, abstract way, um, then it's going to be hard to find a tool that f solves that problem. 
Whereas I think if we get the slicing right and we have, so like, for example, like, you know, you see a lot of people sharing examples of how you can use them to generate automated tests. I still think that's too generalized. I want to use it to generate my page objects. I want to use it to help me build my utility code. I want to build prompts in uh, unit tests as prompts with tools like Copilot to help me build my production code. I'm going, I'm getting quite uh, very specific slices um, where I think that it can be of use to me. So I, I think that's kind of why I sit in that middle ground is because I think if you do try to go too generalized, you are either going to end up in the land of hallucinations because these models want to give you some sort of kind of response, some sort of kind of answer. Um, and also, I just don't think it does it, it gives, doesn't it does do the craft of testing any service because it is assuming that basically it, 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 is, it is an inherently algorithmic activity when testing is not. It's both. It's algorithmic and heuristic. So, yeah, that's kind of why I sit that sort of in that middle ground. So prompt engineering as a technique, that's like the sort of specific craft. But if you're not, if you don't have the right sort of kind of mindset, the right sort of eye to sort of apply things like task analysis to the things that you're doing to break them down into specific chunks, then you are going to run into problems like hallucinations. You are going to have issues where it becomes less value to you or you end up tr over trusting these models and they lead you down the garden path the wrong way in your testing. Absolutely. I love how you, so you have to understand what the large language model you're dealing with does. I know a lot of people were like, uh, like chat GPT 3.5 is, is bad with, uh, like math and figures like that. And so someone would do things with it and say, look, see, you can't figure this out and say, well, it's dumb rather than realizing what it's good for and, and show an example of what it's good for. It's almost like they set up the straw man for it. So I don't know why I put on that rant, but understanding mm. what, what you're, what, what it is, is going to help you, I think, be better with it, I guess. Yeah, yeah, and it's again like to be to play the devil's advocate. That that isn't an invalid way to prove it. So there are a lot of papers out there that research these models and demonstrate how they're not very good at planning. And there's a real debate in that sort of space about whether these these models are actually creative, can actually help you plan. But really, like again, if you don't think of them as planning tools, but think of them as assistants, and you're doing the planning. So like I think of it as like an area of effect model. I'm planning, I'm making the decisions, and then I use these tools to kind of enhance the different aspects of the plan that I'm implementing, then they can be really valuable. So how do you know what it can and cannot do then? What's realistic? Because the opening of my show was created by AI. All I did was say, <laughs> write a song about Automation yeah. Guild. Spit it out, like things like creative that you thought wouldn't be replaced are being replaced. So is that creative? Is it garbage? Like, how do you know what is, what, what is, what to use it for? I guess to, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think, I think it depends on what your, so I think uh, something I've been thinking about a little bit is like where the quality characteristics fit into this. So for you, that thing that you've generated, um, you know, I'm going to assume is ideal for you because it's something that serves the larger uh, product, which is your podcasts and, and the conversations and things that are going on there. Whereas if maybe it was sort of, you know, this is a band that's trying to get their first album out um, and they've just literally just got uh, AI to generate all of it for them, then there's less sincerity there. Like the quality characteristics change and shift. You're looking for a band, you're looking for musicians who have, you know, channeled some sort of artistic sort of impression uh, through their instruments, but that's all completely, completely gone. It's why I think like, for example, like in genres, uh, so I've mentioned this before in the past, like uh, Rick Beato, the music producer, uh, he's got big music producer on YouTube, does all these sort of videos and stuff like that. He talks a lot about how AI has slowly crept into the music industry. So things like auto-tune are algorithmic based. And what it's done is, is it's nudged us ever, ever, ever closer to just fully uh, um, AI generated. But I think that if you tried to do that in other genres of music, you'd probably get more pushback or you'd probably get people noticing it more. So I, I do think like quality characteristics, you know, we're just talking about music here, but anything like this, you can um, start to see that um, 
yeah, that quality characteristics, context matters in terms of how you react to what's being produced. I slowed for a second there because I was reminded as well, like a great example is the inverse. So someone would create an, um, a piece of work, a written piece of work. Um, they were writing part of their novel. They fed it in and they said, do the next two chapters and then deliberately didn't write it like that. So they use it like as anti-creative because they were like, well, this is this is what it's coming out with is formulaic. So I can use it as a guide to go somewhere else. So again, it's it's that sort of how you approach it. You know, we we still have a say, we still have an impression. We are interpreting whether something is art or not, whether it's useful or not. The the, the challenge again is is making sure that we have a clear picture of what that is. And slicing can help because if it's not a broad, broad thing that we're like, I don't know, could work, might not work. Whereas if you have clear, distinct ideas of what's right and what's wrong, it can be easier to react that way, make decisions. Makes sense. So I, I think you covered a lot of this in the, like you said, the first part, it's all about like mindset type of things. Um, now, how, when you get to context, then can you talk a little bit about maybe the things that can help you with that? Like from some examples of the chapters, I think are really good is uh, rapid data creation. I know a lot of people struggle with data creation. I would assume it'd be really good with data creation, but uh, maybe some examples of what you you think it's good for, because you mentioned you don't think it's really valuable for creating all the tests for you, but you, you're almost using it for a more specific slices of uh, activities. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so, so the, the data one is, I think, is a, one of my favorite chapters because it, it does clearly show like how you know, data management is one of the hardest things in testing at all. Um, but actually focusing very thinly sliced in that space, you can get a lot of value from it. Um, what's interesting, like on the context side is, is things like one of the challenges of data is, is complexity and structure, for example, or the fact that you want to, you know, do things like data masking, or you just want to generate some data, but it hits a lot of different tables. So things like retrieval augmented generation or RAG can be useful because um, you can actually, you know, allow it access to your database and maybe say, generate me a bunch of records based on these, these rules, and it will go and extract some example data from your database pull that into your prompt to give it that much more context. And then you'll get some sort of response back that's uh, much more useful for you. If you care about certain domain words and want relationships between keywords and domains, then things like fine tuning can work because you're basically pushing those weights and balances towards your context. You don't teach it knowledge, but you, again, you push that needle towards your context. So yeah, ultimately that, that's what context is. It's, it's not just being aware that you need to add some information, but it's also knowing what's the right information to add as well. Um, you know, there's a real interesting conversation as well with things like Gemini 1.5. You know, it's got a context window of a million tokens. So you can literally put a book in there and then say, you know, I need to know a specific piece of information in that book. Um, is that good? I don't know. It may be, it might not be. Would it be more effective if I just put the chapter in or the paragraph in? I don't know. So you got you kind of got to experiment with those sort of things. So yeah, so context is about being aware of adding it in, but also having the the ability to detect what's right and what's wrong. And you can use tools for that, or you can kind of use your own sort of judgment. So great chapter. People definitely need to get the book to get their hands on that. Another chapter that that stuck out to me was uh, you have one called assisted exploratory testing with AI, which I was kind of surprised by. Maybe a little controversial if you just looked at the title. So maybe give a little insight around that. <laughs> so yeah, again, it's the same, the same things like exploratory testing. I don't want an LLM to be an exploratory tester. But if I have um, you know, some some AI agents or some prompts that are available to me, and as I'm exploring and I'm like, you know, so we talked about the data example. So you're, oh, I just need 20 records quickly set up, um, but they need to be unique. You can use a prompt to generate all that for you and throw it in. Um, you're writing your test report notes and you need to <clears throat> convert them into something that's a bit more legible or something that has like some sort of kind of sentiment analysis to sort of say whether the quality is increased or decreased and just sort of kind of add that into your report. 
then those sort of things can be used as well. So the whole of that chapter, again, is this slicing mindset of, and, and I do a case study of where I do an exploratory testing session and I demonstrate where I'm using these prompts. So yeah, I, I like that chapter because it's kind of building on some of the stuff that we've learned earlier on, because we're pulling from like the data side. We're pulling from the, oh, suggest me some ideas. Here's, here's some heuristics. Here's some things I've done. Suggest me some new ideas. Break me out the mold of my, my testing. Um, it's sort of kind of combining those things together. Um, and like using tools during exploratory test testing sessions is a, is a big passion of my life. I, I love a good session where you use lots of different tools. So yeah, that's what I'm trying to sort of kind of convey in this, this, that chapter of, yeah, there are lots of different ways in which you can call an LLM and maybe you'd, like I said, you just have a load of prompts saved somewhere, or you can use agents that can help you with these sort of things as well. Great. And uh, before that, you also have a chapter on UI automation uh, how to improve UI automation with AI. Um, can you just give a few more examples? I know you said like help you write page objects and uh, like small slices like that. Does it help with anything else that people may not be familiar with? A lot of people just think of like, it'll help me find a flaky locator, but uh, are there any other use cases? Yeah, so it's, um, so I think, yeah, that, that was one of the, the key examples that I put in that chapter. And then again, kind of going back to data. So integrating with, Things like open API platforms um, to you know call a call a model that's sitting on a platform somewhere and get some sort of retrievable data that way. Um, there's some of the stuff that I didn't really kind of because I just didn't feel like there was too much to go into, but I think is interesting is is kind of using it for analysis for results as well um, and giving you sort sort kind of interpretations there. Um, and as well, it's sort of. You know, it's it's a combination of that, but it's also um, kind of combination of like leveraging things like GitHub uh, Copilot, those sort of kind of tools as well. So using, so this is the thing as well. Like we tend to talk about LLMs as singular things, whereas I think some of the successful teams, whether you're using it to assist your own work or building products, you use different models for different purposes. So I might use. Um, something like chat GPT to like say generate that page object model. Um, but once I've got that in place, then I can use GitHub Copilot to quickly generate the code within my IDE. As long as I've got my page object open in my IDE, <clears throat> excuse me, then I can then fly through and then I can start baking in the business rules because like, again, it goes back to context because if Copilot starts going, oh, hey, you want to enter a username, right? Here's my suggested username. Oh, hang on. You've given me an email address and we actually do employee IDs or we do usernames. It doesn't know those sort of things. So using different models to help me get certain ways, but I'm still jumping in at different points to kind of sort of bake the rules in there as well. Nice, nice. So, you know, you, you probably get asked this all the time. Besides prompt engineering, what skills do testers need to know about to work with AI? I would think they'd have to become better testers because then AI is it going to replace testing, but maybe I'm nuts there. And also like, do you see people hate this term manual testing, but do you see that going away in five to 10 years? Like, where do you see, how can people use AI better? What skills do they need? And will they eventually be replaced by, by the AI? Yes. Yeah, so I, I'm, I, I really like the idea. I, I, think I've, <laughs> I think I've mentioned this nearly on every, every situation where I've been interviewed. I tend to be talking about uh, Nicholas Carr's book, The Glass Cage. And he talks about the kind of the principles of algorithmic problems and heuristic problems. So when you talk about manual testing, I think about it more in that sort of it's heuristic based testing with elements of algorithmic tasks within it. Um, and sometimes the needle may be moved towards algorithmic more, sometimes less, depending if you're like doing exploratory testing versus test cases. So again, it's that sort of being able to identify when you're in a situation where you're doing something that's algorithmic. So clear steps can be explicitly described. Um, you can kind of tell when you're not following the path versus the heuristic stuff um, where it's sort of, you know, more creative, more freewheeling. So I think we need to get better at being attuned to that. Um, and I think this kind of, one of the things I've been talking about for for a long time is that that sort of idea of, um, you know, using any sort of kind of test automation. It's great in the algorithmic parts, but it's not so good in the heuristic parts. 
So yeah, that kind kind of mindset. Um, you know, th- there is the potential. I've been thinking a little bit about this about how it could open up automation more to new testers or like to to those who are sort of shied away from the sort of more technical aspects because um you know you can basically provide it with your instructions and then it turns the syntax you know it converts it into the syntax that you need so you don't necessarily know what the special incantations are to make the script work but um you know you can at least plan it out in your head and describe it so that a tool can kind of convert it. And it's the same things like for code reviews as well, like being able to provide blobs of code, assuming you know, you're allowed to do that, um, but providing blobs of code to give you feedback that way. So I, I think that, that there's, there's more benefits than there are risks to, 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 to automation, uh, sorry, to testing roles. Um, but I think, again, it goes back to mindset. We need to be clear about where they have a purpose, where they have a use, and where they don't, um, and try not to get sort of kind of too caught up in the hyperbole, you know, d- regardless of perspective. Nice. All right, so we covered part one and part two of the book. You need to grab it to really find more. But like part three, let's wrap it up here. Uh, I, I, at the time of of this recording, it was called customizing LLMs for testing contexts. I assume it still is. Um, Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> but. When people hear LLMs, they're like, well, it, it doesn't work with my company because it's not trained on my data, my situation, so therefore it's useless. You have like like three three chapters here. Like one is customizing LLMs uh, to help you better with testing um, and, and how to fine tune LLMs with business domain knowledge. Maybe can you like sum up the third part a little bit more as a teaser so people can get their hands on the book to, to learn more. What were you talking yeah. about here? So, so the first chapter kind of puts forward the argument of context is needed, all the things I've kind of talked about. And then it sort of gently introduces the two uh, approaches that we can apply, which is retrieval augmented generation. So we can add more context to the prompt and we can do that programmatically. So we can either connect it to log files, uh, databases, um, things like vector databases that we hear a lot about when talking about sort of uh, RAG. So it gives an introduction to how that works and, and you know, it gives you the opportunity to build your own. Um, it's not going to make you some sort of RAG expert by the end of it, but it's enough for you to appreciate when that approach can be of use um, to open up context and things like that. And then the final chapter, yeah, it goes into fine tuning and it's the same sort of thing, um, going through the basics of how fine tuning works, letting you have the opportunity to fine tune something, but not necessarily to make you an AI engineer or a machine learning engineer, just enough that you appreciate that um, the complexity of fine tuning, but also that it you don't teach a large language model through fine tuning. You just move the weights and balances um, in, in, in favor towards, towards, your com- uh, towards your context. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what kind of part three is. It's sort of taking it to that next level as well. Love it. So this is a must get your hands on resource. We'll have a link for it in the show notes. But Mark, before we go, there's one piece of actual advice you can give to someone to help them with their AI testing efforts. And what's the best way to get our hands on your new book, Software Testing with Generative AI? You can get uh, a copy of my book on manning.com. Um, it's still in early access. So that means that if you purchase a copy now, you get free, you get access to the digital copy now. And then once the book is finished, you will get a print copy sent to you if you choose that option. Uh, but what's really useful as well is that you can actually read the book, drop comments in and give me feedback. And I do read it and I do react to it and I factor it into the book. Um, single bit of advice. Um, is basically don't be afraid to experiment with them. Uh, don't be afraid to sort of try out different techniques um, and different approaches to and, and tweaking prompts. Um, you know, I, it, it's where my journey started with this was just, you know, uh, I was trying to get it to generate some SQL for me and it, it went horribly wrong. But it, it's from there, it's from that experimentation, you learn more and you can sort of practice and get more engaged. And it's not something that's for the technically minded only. It is it is accessible to everyone. And that's why it's so popular. Thanks again for your automation awesomeness.
The links to everything of value we covered in this episode, hand on over to testguild.com forward slash A504. And if the show has helped you in any way, why not rate it and review it in iTunes? Reviews really help in the rankings of the show, and I read each and every one of them. So that's it for this episode of the Test Guild Automation Podcast. I'm Joe, and my mission is to help you succeed with creating end-to-end, full-stack automation awesomeness. As always, test everything and keep the good. Cheers. Thanks for listening to the Test Guild Automation Podcast. Head on over to testguild.com for full show notes, amazing blog articles, and online testing conferences. Don't forget to subscribe to the Guild to continue your testing journey.